we are so excited to have Matt and Anna with us. Uh, and this, this really is like, this is an investment into you guys. When we bring in um, guests from out of town, this is an investment into the house. It's an investment into our people. Um, it's also an investment into us because we know that there's nothing more beneficial than getting outside perspective. Um, I love what Bill and Benny, jo Benny Johnson used to say. They would say uh, that we don't want to become inbred <laughs> by being by being in their own echo chamber and only hearing their perspective. It's so good and healthy to to experience other people and their perspectives. And so we want to be bringing in um, guests. Um, and so tonight we prepared questions for Matt and Anna, but um, we want you guys to know Matt and Anna are like family to us. Um, even though we've only, it's only been like two years of really being around each other more recently, but Matt and Lydia and I, we all went to the same ministry school and actually my first itinerary speaking engagement was at Matt's youth group. First one. <laughs> yep. So um, that was the first one. So we uh, work. We love them. Um, we uh, they're at uh, Harvest Chapel in Pennsylvania, um, where Dan Moeller, Todd White, and uh, the greats have all sprung up from the Great Well of Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, so they come from a a real deep well, and they are the lead pastors at Harvest Chapel now. Um, and so. How about you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves and then we'll, we'll jump into this. Sure. Yeah. Like Ethan said, we got to meet while we were at Bethel. Seems like it was yesterday, but time has flown by. Um, I've been I would have been there, but I was too young. Yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> yeah, um, we actually met once I moved back to Pennsylvania. So yeah, I, I just was... want to make it clear that they started dating when she was of age. Yes. <laughs> We're I only feel four like years that was, four that years been, younger than me. That so. been that's, a whole, that's a whole high school career. So, jeez, <laughs> oh, getting roasted. <laughs> no, but um, I uh, I did the three year program at Bethel, and then I was just really like, Lord, I don't want to just continue to be an intern. I don't want to continue to just be a student. Um, God, I really want to be used by you. So there was a family that planted a church about thirty miles south of Reading in a town called Red Bluff, and they needed a youth pastor. So I accepted that position, and uh, that's when I invited Ethan to come out to speak to my my small, humble uh, youth group in a living room. And um, I was there for two years, and then I uh, started to have some prophetic dreams about transition. I didn't know exactly what it meant. I didn't really have a plan B. I was just giving God my yes and um, started to feel like shifting could happen. And I remember meeting with my my pastor at the time. And I just told him, I said, the only church I would want to be at is a church back home in Pennsylvania called Harvest Chapel. And uh, they already have a youth pastor. So I don't really see that that would ever happen. Um, don't ever say that. Um, if you don't actually want to move and do something, because two weeks later, I got a call from uh, the senior pastor, Pastor Don, and I just kind of get got to explain where the church was at. And um, that was pretty much the confirmation that I needed. So I began to prepare the youth group to be taken over by another couple. And I moved home just out of blind faith, not knowing exactly what was going to happen. I went from being a full-time youth pastor, um, working with BSSM, being mentored by some of the leaders, super connected. And the Lord was just like, I want you to lay all that down and go back to Pennsylvania. So I went back to Pennsylvania to just be a youth leader um, not knowing exactly what God was going to do. There was no promise of position. It was just, there's a place for you to serve. So I did that um, within a couple months of being back home. I thought the one thing I would leave Bethel was, a, was, was with a wife. Um, that didn't happen uh, for me. It happened for Ethan. Excited for you, buddy. Um, but I always say this. I say, I had to move uh, from Pennsylvania to California to become the man that Anna deserved because um, she was in Pennsylvania the whole time. He so, likes to say that to get brownie points. Well, it is, it works though. but it is true. <laughs> it is true. And uh, moved back home and not to tell the, all the details, but within a couple months, I had met Anna. Um, our first date was January 1st. We were engaged May 19th and married October 24th. So come on. Uh, Don't mess around. Don't mess around. If you know it's the Lord, go for it. Um, 
but we uh, joined the church together and uh, we've been on staff at Harvest together um, for almost the last decade and um, never got into youth ministry to get out of it. Um, but one day Pastor Don just popped his head into my office and was like, where do you see yourself in five years? It was like nine o'clock. I was like, well, I see myself at the Keurig in about 10 minutes, but <laughs> not sure about the next five years. But it was like my spirit answered. And I, I, I said, I could see myself leading a church. And um, he kind of just smiled and walked away. And that kind of became the, uh, the first conversation to me and Anna um, being able to receive the, the church from them. So we, we accepted that position two years ago. So we're two years in uh, with being the lead pastors of Harvest Chapel. So, yeah. And we're expecting our first child. Yes. Yes. If you were here yeah. last year, you know that we prayed for them. So to have a baby, they'd been um, waiting for a very long time and we all extended our hands and we prayed and then look what happened. Yeah. They're 20, 27 weeks tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. A little boy. Come on. Yep. Yeah, we are so excited to have them. It's very fun for Liddy and I because they became lead pastors at almost the same time that we became lead pastors. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, it's really, really fun to be able to bounce things off of each other. Okay, are we ready to get into this? You guys ready? Okay, the first, the, we got a couple doozies in here, okay? We're not, we're going to get uncomfortable tonight. Um, but uh, we're going to start start light, start soft. Um, first, have you ever had a moment in your discipleship where you felt stuck, whether in habits, unhealthy emotional patterns, or in your relationship to God? And if so, how did you get unstuck? You want me to start? Everybody's looking at me. Okay. Um, <laughs> We're not going to answer because they hear us all the time. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So ha have I ever been stuck and how have I gotten unstuck? Um, yes, I've been stuck. I think everybody in this room has been stuck before. Um, my relationship with the Lord is has been very long. Um, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was a little, little girl, um, filled with the spirit when I was a little girl. Um, so I've walked with him for almost my whole life, not my whole life, but almost my whole life. Um, and I think the times that I've gotten stuck, um, the best thing that I've been able to do is to get my eyes off of myself. Um, because it's really easy whenever you get, it's really easy to create patterns within your Christianity that it's a, it's like a system. It can get pharisaical where it's, it's, it's that systematic thing where it says, if I do this and I pray like this and I go to church like this, then everything should work out for me. But that's not how life works. And that's not what the Bible promises us. And so we're actually promised hardship and we're actually promised, we're, we're promised him in the midst of it, but we're not promised an easy life. And so when we go through hard things and we, we face these things, it's really easy to get our eyes on ourselves. But if we can just look to him and get out of it that way and worship him that way, and honestly, very, very like, honestly, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because there's been so many times in my walk with Christ that I've not known what to pray or known how to pray or whatever, or just feeling that yuck inside of you. But the Holy Spirit is the power to live this Christian life. And so being able to pray in the spirit to just be able to, to and it's the Holy Spirit interceding through you for you. And so whenever you can't get yourself unstuck by any, because sometimes we can read and memorize this thing and it's, it seems like it's not working. It always is. It's always getting inside of us, but we need the helper to actually pull us out. That's what Jesus gave us the helper for, right? So it's like, I, that's my personal answer. She was, she was worth the wait, guys. She was worth the wait. Come on. <laughs> Seriously, um, not to put her on the spot, but one thing when we led the youth group together was, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in Bethel Assemblies of God and it was, it was an amazing church, but we, I kind of overcomplicated being filled with the spirit. 
And I thought it was going to be this like mystical experience, this out of body experience where my soul was going to leave my body. I was going to hover over myself and look down. It was just, I made it way more (laughs) mystical and difficult than it was. Um, But one thing that Anna really, I I feel like uh, an anointing that she walks in is really helping people step into their prayer language. Um, So if there's anyone in here that has never spoken in tongues or you have a desire to do that, I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time with Anna. We're not in a rush uh, when we're here with you guys. I actually purposely asked these guys like on Sunday, like, you know, if there's any chance that we could just stay with you guys Sunday, that way we could just be with your people, pray with them as much as they would like to. So just take advantage of that because we overcomplicate that. But that's so true that like if you have the Holy Spirit, like it doesn't matter where you are. You, one, you're, you're never alone. You're never alone. Like the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives within you. Um, but that's something that's such a powerful weapon is being able to use that prayer language and, and allow him to teach you uh, things through it. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So good. Uh, we're seeing a lot of Christians right now in our Christian postmodern American culture deconstructing their faith. Um, it's becoming very normal for somebody to get hurt in the church. It's not, it's not abnormal. It's actually pretty normal to get hurt in a church at some point in your life. And then we're seeing people go and deconstruct their faith. Um, why would that be problematic or how, how is deconstruction problematic in our culture right now, in your opinion? Like how would you, or is it? Yeah. No, well, you can de- de- deconstruct your way out of the church, which is super dangerous. Um, a lot of the times we have one thing that we really need to focus on that's maybe broken. And I heard a pastor, his name's Nathan Finocchio, explain this with the analogy of a dishwasher. Like if my dishwasher is broken, um, I can either call a repairman to come and, and find the, the part that's broken and replace that one part. And then the dishwasher would work again, or I can decide to pull the dishwasher out, take a part the dishwasher piece by piece to where now my living room is filled with all of these parts. And now I have to put it all back together. And I think that's what deconstruction is. It's instead of focusing on one thing that needs attention and fixed, we take apart all of it. And then we get overwhelmed when we try to put it back together. And instead of doing that, we run away. So I don't want to add more to that. I think that's. I'll add. I don't think. Going to, because again, I grew up in Christianity. I grew up with, with knowing the Lord and I've seen my, my father is an itinerant minister. So we've been traveling, I mean, honestly, since I was a baby. So I've seen different churches. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And sometimes people grow up in the church and they're taught things that actually are not biblical. And it's okay to test the words that are coming out of your shepherd's mouth through the Bible. But what's the heart motive behind it? Is it to prove them wrong or is it to seek truth? And so there's a big difference because if you're already hurt, then you're, you're looking to prove somebody wrong. You're looking to prove the church wrong, the Lord wrong. But if you're actually weighing it with a heart that's, that's pure and that says, I just, I'm asking because I want the purity of it. I want the truth of it, then that's okay. But you have to do it with accountability. A lot of people like to use the excuse that it's going to, I'm just doing the, it's just with me and the Lord. Like I'm just, I'm just processing with, it's just me and the Lord. I'm good. Like, and people isolate themselves and that's where they get themselves in trouble. So you have to remain in community with a, and and you don't have to listen to everybody's voice. Pick somebody that you know that you trust, or you at least trust mostly, you know, if if, if somebody that you can look to and and they know the word and and you can have them as that accountability um, and do it with them and ask them questions and just don't do it alone. But I think it is okay to ask questions. Um, but it's not okay to come at it with a judgmental heart. Mm. Mm. And I would say just tagging onto that, it's, it's not that it's not okay because it's being offensive 
to the teacher, to the spiritual leader, it's not okay because you will, you will self-destruct your way out of every church right. building. Right. And for your benefit of growing in the Lord, we need each other as Hebrews says, to come together and to co-encourage. So right. for our, for our own sake of development, we have to come at it with a heart that wants to learn, that wants to hear, right. not one that's, you know, wanting to self-destruct. Right. Yeah. I just love that metaphor, metaphor, Matt, because I feel like being able to talk to somebody who's like, well, I'm deconstructing my faith to just be like, here's what I've seen when people have deconstructed is I've seen them tear the whole thing apart so much. So they have nothing to look at anymore. There's nothing to consider anymore because it's just, yeah, it's not recognizable. It's just confusion, right? That's how I get Like when I get anybody buy anything off of Ikea before, <laughs> right? It is so many pieces. You're like, why can't they at least make half of this? And it's so many pieces. You're just like, goodness gracious. And then it's in Norwegian and you're just like, what is going on? Um, and, and it's really that it's like you, you, if you, if you were born to guard people, to, to protect people, to protect the, to, to lead the people we love to Jesus, not to lead them deeper into confusion. You know what I mean? And I think that the hardest part of this is a lot of people who have been hurt grew up in a culture where you couldn't ask questions. Where it's like you can't identify, well, I don't understand why the dishwasher is broken. I have a question. No, shush. The dishwasher is fine. It's like it doesn't sound fine, though. It sounds like a raccoon that's dying in the, you know what I mean? And, and I think that's the thing where it's like, it's like allowing, and again, you guys have heard me preach this. Like we need to understand what we're getting into in the word so that when somebody goes, I have a question. We can answer that question or at least have a good path to like, you know, I don't know how to properly answer that, but I know someone or a resource that can, or here in this, like in this book, first John will really help you, you know, things like that. It's just being able to like be resourceful in that sense. So yeah, love that answer. It's so good. Um, here we go. You guys ready? What does being a Christian during this election year look like? What does it look like to be a Christian here? I'm going to rephrase it again. What does it look like to be a Christian in what feels like probably the highest stake election? Doesn't it seem like everyone does? Every single one feels that way, but it really feels that way every single time. <laughs> so what does it look like to be a Christian right now? Um, given we have Kamala Harris on one side, we have Donald Trump on the other side. We have uh, RFK somewhere in the middle. Um, and what does it, what does it look like right now to navigate this as a Christian, as we approach November? I'll give a few practical thoughts. Um, I think it's important for us as Christians to be informed so we can transform. But if you cannot watch the news without partnering with fear and anxiety and hatred and partner with gossip, I would really encourage you to turn it off. Because you cannot allow it to control you. You cannot allow it to control your hope level. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is the same the day before the election and the day after the election. My hope, my hope isn't found in our next president. My hope is and will always be found in Jesus Christ. I think it's important for us as Christians to know this and vote this yeah. to the best of our ability. Yeah. I think that's really important because we've had a history of not showing up to the polls, but then we also complain about the outcome. <laughs> but when you're at the polls, where's your heart? Are you angry at the ones supporting the other person? Are you allowing yourself to be in a situation where you're at the polls and are we asking the Holy Spirit questions like, Holy Spirit, I'm here. What are you doing? Yeah. Is there someone here that I could pray for and not be so focused on just getting in and voting and getting out because there's such this spiritual warfare going on and I just have to get back into my closet so I can take care of this. We're called to actually bring peace to those polls. Mm -hmm. My peace isn't found in the polls, it's found in the Prince of Peace. Yeah. 
So everywhere you go as a believer, you're bringing the spirit of God with you. I don't know if we're able to put up scripture, but I'm just going to read a little bit. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. I just want to, I just want to read a few verses. Um, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living within you. That's a big if. Yeah. I love the ifs of the Bible. When I see an if, I circle it. Because it's a promise. Yeah. If you do this, this happens. Yeah. Come on, dude. And remember that those who don't, do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. So why are we mad at a lost world for acting lost? They're lost. And they actually need what you say you have. You have the treasure that they need. It's the hope within you. It's the, it's, it's the Christ within you that's the hope of glory for the people in the world around you. So we can't get so offended at a lost person for, for, for being lost and confused and, and being tormented. They are being tormented. They're lost and they need what you have. Verse 10, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. I say that because you are a thermostat, not a thermometer. You are called to change the temperature in the room, not be affected by it. So voting day, day of election, day after election, we're called to be the peace that this world truly needs. We, we have what they need. So I would encourage you not to partner with the spirit of fear, but perfect love that casts out all fear and allow that peace to lead you and guide you in all that you do. Like I said, I think it's important to be informed so that you can transform. The enemy gives us his strategy. Turn on the news. That's his strategy. Listen to what they're trying to accomplish. That's his strategy. So why wouldn't we look at that and say, wow, that's what the enemy's trying to do. If the enemy's trying to divide, I bet you God wants to unify. Yep. So God, right now, I just come against this spirit of division. And God, I thank you that you have a plan for our nation. God, I thank you that you are for us and not against us. God, I thank you that you sent your son because you love the world. For God so loved the world that he gave, he sowed his son into the world. He didn't look at it and go, wow, I'm so offended. What am I going to do with this? He had a solution before there was ever a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think too, like, look at the book of Daniel. Honestly, look at the entire Bible. The entire Bible has so many stories of kings and rulers that are terrible, and what, what's the response of the Israel people to, to those kings? And there's a verse, I don't remember if it's in Daniel or if it's in Romans, but about the Lord, set, the Lord sets up kings and tears down kings. Yep. And we, we forget that. We, we, we view leaders as, well, they're evil incarnated, so the Lord must not have had anything to do with that. Like, the Lord is a mystery. It's the, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to seek it out. And so we don't need to, we're not entitled to answers to every question that we have. But we are called to stand in righteousness and stand for what this book says and stand for the way that would be honoring unto the Lord. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were honoring to Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was awful. They still acknowledged him as king. They still acknowledged him as king. That's not my king. king. It's not my president. <laughs> That's not my king. Yeah. That's not my president. Yeah. He actually is your president. Yeah. And honor looks like something. Because when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't allow what was happening to dictate whether they would... St- 
they refuse to bow, but they also refuse to dishonor in the same moment. And what happened? God was with them the entire time. As they're, as they're getting closer to that chamber where the flames are so hot that literally the guards are dying as they're throwing them into the fire, but then they're in the fire, and what happens? They see another one with them, Christ before Christ. And you know what's cool if you study this story? The only thing that burned up was the things binding their arms together. Mm-hmm. Wow. Come on. And then they come out and literally law is changed. Isn't that amazing? So why can't we look at that example and say, oh, look, I'm, I'm going to not bow to this evil king, but I'm also not going to allow myself to partner with dishonor. Because what would have happened if they're just like, Get, who knows what would have happened if they allowed that to take over their hearts and their feelings and their emotions? So that's really powerful. Yeah. And I, the, when you're saying that, all I'm thinking is like, okay, if, if we go to the election, okay, and somebody gets elected that we're like, oh, that is a bummer. And it's this like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. You look at it from a perspective of turn the heat up. Yeah. Because when the heat gets turned up, chains break and laws change. Jesus shows up and Jesus shows up. You know what I mean? And to me, it, it's a, it's not a, it's just that there's always hope in every situation. There's, there's no not, such thing. Steve Backlund, your hopelessness about a problem is a bigger problem than the problem. Yes. Say that again. Your hopelessness about a problem is a bigger problem than the problem. There is no such thing as a hopeless situation, especially when we're the ones that are called to carry the hope. Mm-hmm. Hope himself God is my source. I'm going to go here. Do okay? it. Yeah, I'm going to go. go here. Because I don't know if it was last year or, or what or the last election, but I was being very challenged, especially when you're in a leadership role and, like, you have to address things. Like, there's an ass- assassination attempt on our president, and then we have church. Okay, I, 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 need, to, I need to have some kind of thoughts and, and concerns and, and, and things about that. But when you see Jesus... Jesus is and will always be our greatest example of what it looks like to be a Christian. We are Christ-like ones. That's what it means to be a Christian. So Jesus is being beaten and spit on and mocked and whipped and beaten and literally nailed to a tree. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That is our greatest example. There's, there's no example in this room that trumps that, no pun intended, that trumps that. Uh-oh. No, there, there's no example. There's, but it, it really grinds my gears yeah. when I can see someone that is professing Christ, partnering with an agenda like the whole Let's Go Brandon slogan. That's demonic. And it's not okay. It's literally not okay. And I say that because I'm leaving my church one day and I see a bumper sticker on someone's car that's attending my church. And I said, that's a problem. That is a problem. We we are literally partnering with something that is cursing a human being that whether we believe it or not is created in the image and likeness of God. And if they don't know the Lord and God forbid something would happen to them, they're not going to be with the Lord for eternity. And that should hurt my heart. So am I willing to literally fall on my knees? Like, have we complained? Have we prayed as much as we've complained? Have I personally, as a pastor, prayed for President Biden as much as I probably should have the last however long it's been? No, I have not. and, and, And that's just the honest truth. But I believe that that's a part of being a Christian. It's, it's praying and believing, God, would you open up their eyes? Holy Spirit, would you invade the White House like never before? God, would you invade meetings that have demonic agenda? God, would you just intervene? Would you speak? Would, would, would you allow them to hear your voice, God? Because you're the only one that can turn this around. What if we prayed like that on a daily basis? I wonder if we would see things change because Jesus, when he gets caught, when they come and they capture him, he doesn't go, boys, it's time to riot the streets. Peter, grab your sword. We got ears to cut. (laughs) You know, let's go, Caesar. They're not out there mocking and, and, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. 
that's the example that we have to look at. That just convicts me. There's um, a missionary from the 50s, Jim Elliott. If, if you know me, you know I love the Elliots, but he, I, I don't hold this same intensity of the stance, but he, um, in college, he, he had to go through this moment of, uh, they were drafting for, for the war and, um, he had to go through this moment of, he was a pacifist first off. So he didn't believe in, in killing. And, um, he also didn't vote. He didn't vote for leaders because he believed so deeply, um, the, uh, we are not of this world. We are here, but we're passing through and, Not to say that that is the stance that we need to take as believers, but we do need to understand that this life is but a vapor. And yes, policies matter because people matter and they our policies affect people. They affect all of us. Um, But if we are more concerned about what is going on in this world than what will happen in eternity with these politicians, with the people around us, that's like a scary place to be. It's just putting your eggs in this world, you know, and not the other. So. So what we're saying is go vote, <laughs> but your eggs are not in this basket. Life they're in, here. they're not like, this is just part of the process of living is being here. But our, our hope is not being put in who we're voting for. Our hope has been in Jesus this whole time. So vote. Yeah and vote based off of what the Holy Spirit's saying. And, um, and I think like for me, when I vote, the thing that I pray is I pray what Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. Jesus went to the father. He's like, I have a preference here. Here's my preference. Father, my preference would be, I don't go to the cross. That's my preference, but it's not my will. It's your will. And so when I cast my vote, I'm like, this is my vote. This is what I believe to be the best situation for my kids. Like, honestly, when I'm thinking about this November, I don't care about economics at all right now. I care about the ideologies that are becoming like invading our schools. So for me, I'm like, I'm voting for my children. That's all I care about right now. I don't care about how our economy is. Honestly, I care about whether my son believes whether he is a boy or a girl. And honestly, that's like, like, I don't want my kid, my 13 year old growing up and going and, and just being like, I don't, I have to make these decisions. I have to think, I have to think these things. And it's like the, there's such a demand to choose a demand to have an opinion about absolutely everything, even to the point of creating an identity around something at such a young age. And so I just feel like I'm like, I don't want, like, can our kids just be kids for like their childhood for a minute. And so for me, I'm like, this will be my vote. And it's going to be that my children have a good and a wholesome future where they don't have to be just bombarded by sexual beliefs and sexual ideologies and things like that. Um, But at the end of the day, no matter where it goes, dude, I'm good. Yeah. Like he's the king, right? Anything else on that? Anybody? I think too, that we, we can get obsessed with watching every rally, watching every bit of news. And it's really not that hard to just look up the policies of each candidate and then which one lines up with the Bible the most. They're not all going to line up with the Bible. We have two people running who are pro-choice. They're both for murder. Do you know what I mean? So we're not, everything's going to line up, but there is one that lines up a bit more. And so it's going in and just being like, which one looks the most like the kingdom of heaven. They're both not it, but which one's the most it's, and get off the news. Yes. You ready for the next one? No, I'm just kidding. You, I'm trying to make you think that it's going to be really intense. Does this make like, are we, we're all, all, all okay. Cause I, I think sometimes when I've gone on to politics and Sunday mornings, people are thinking I'm like, yeah, just don't vote you, you don't. And I'm like, no, we need to vote a hundred percent. Um, I like to jab the Republican beliefs because I come from Republican beliefs and I see a lot of what he's talking about with the whole, let's go Brandon thing. Or when our president clearly has dementia and I almost see, uh, Christians going, yeah, Oh, I just love seeing him fumble and him just, just stupid going deeper and deeper into decline. 
and I'm seeing Christians celebrate someone's brain dying or however the process is. I'm not a doctor, but you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm just like, bro, what in the world? Like, do you think Jesus is going, is celebrating this? You know what I mean? And, and it's like, we have to, we have to come back to Jesus every single time. How would Jesus handle this? And I'm telling you, I think that if you look at the Bible, the Jews all said, Jesus, pick a side, Rome or Jews. And he's like, nah, he didn't. He's like, no, nah, I'm okay. Give to what, to, give what to belongs to God and give what belongs to Caesar. I'm here to do something different. You know, and I, I think I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in like, well, God is he's for this. And it's like, you know, I don't know. Like, I, I think that he is for babies not dying. I think that he is for children being in schools, not being indoctrinated in weird beliefs. Yes, 100 percent. But is he for consumerism? Is he for uh, people who are poor being taken care of? Yeah. What does that look like, though? And then everybody gets to argue about what that looks like. But that's where it's like we have to understand there's some gray area here. Yeah. Okay. It's not just one party over the other. There's gray area where I was telling Nate this the other the other week. Um, like, oh, I can't. Sorry. I'm going to derail us for five minutes. I'm thankful that there's people in our world that want to take care of our planet. I, the first commandment to Adam and Eve was, Hey, will you take care of this for me? And then we get all upset about people trying to take care of the environment. Oh, they're just playing tree huggers, you know? And it's like, it's good that we have balance there. Right. And yeah, anyways, I just, I think sometimes we're so like one way or the other, it's like, there's goodness in, in, in people who want to take care of the poor or take care of um, the refugees or whatever it is. It's like, yes, there's an open border crisis and problem, but there's still people involved that are innocent and didn't ask for any of this along the way. So we just have to be yeah. more like compassionate about what the, like how the Lord sees it. And know how to pray because we're not at war with flesh and blood. There's powers and principalities at play. So know that the devil has a very clear agenda and I was reading this one day as I was preparing a sermon and the Holy Spirit just like hit me in the gut with this, but it's Mark chapter five. It's a story where Jesus heals the man at the Gadarenes where he's demon possessed and, you know, all that craziness comes out naked, chained, not a good situation. But starting off in verse six, uh, chapter five, verse six, um, when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Verse nine, then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion because there are many of us inside of this man. When I read that, the Lord said, it's almost like he looked at Jesus and said, we are they them. Oh, snap. So know what we're up against. The devil doesn't get new tricks. His plan is steal, kill, destroy. Manipulate, come against the mind. And I think this is a bigger deal than what we realize. So when we see individuals walking down the streets that are dressed like animals or acting insane or changing their physical appearance or whatever it may be, let's have the question to say, well, maybe this person is struggling with something internally that goes a lot deeper. That we, we want to medicate demons in America and not cast them out. There's a reason why when you go to Africa, you see a lot of demons come out of people because they have no other, there is no other solution. There is no medication. There is no, it's, it's come out. Just like Jesus said, it's that easy. So if we as believers are confident and walk in the spirit of God, know that we have the same spirit of Christ living within us, we would be drawn to have conversations with these individuals and not intimidated by the spirits in them 
I have a lot of Christians come to me and say, well, Pastor Matt, I don't want their yuck to get on me. I'm a lot more concerned about what's in me getting in them. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So if we can realize that what side of, the, of this thing we're on, our heart can actually break for that individual instead of allowing us to partner with offense and anger and, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're here. I can't believe we're dealing with this. I, I, who, who ever thought we'd be here? What if, what if God's spirit can, is actually big enough to handle that? Yeah. But he's just waiting for us to be the hands and feet to see it manifest. Yeah, it's almost like we're in like this, you know, when like, um, when something traumatic happens, like to, a, to let, let's say like 9-11, right? There, this building comes down. There's kind of two different groups of people. There's the people that are just traumatized and they're just kind of, sh- it's that shell shocked where you're just like, I don't know what to do with any of what's happening right now. And it's almost like the church has been shell shocked. But then there's people who are first responders who have trained to be ready to, to there's, a, there's a crisis in front of me. It's time to take action, time to move, time to go. And it's almost like the church has just been shell shocked for like 10 years. Just completely like, how is this happening? I wonder why we're here. Yeah. How did we get here? And it's like, the Lord's like, will you please respond? Like, will you please be a first responder and get into the burning building and get these people out? You know, that's when you were telling me that's like, all I could think of was just that first responder response. So let it be Lord. Um, Here we go. Last one. We're, we're, we had a bunch, but I, I love where this went. Um, as you look back on your life, who or what has had the greatest impact on your spiritual journey thus far? Um, definitely my parents, um, specifically my dad. Um, I'm very thankful for that because that's not everybody's story, especially if you've grown up in ministry. Um, but my parents gave me Jesus and the practices of how to be a Christian, um, as opposed to just, just church, just dragging me to church. Now they did drag me to church when I didn't want to go. That still happened. Um, but the greatest thing, so just a little context, like there was a period of time between probably like 13 and 15, where I just was like, I wanted nothing to do with the church. I loved God, but I was like, I just didn't love the church. I saw my family get hurt by the church. I personally felt hurt by the church with some things, and I just was angry with church people. But the Lord always kept this thing in me where I loved him. And I don't honestly remember if I was, I don't don't remember being like mad at God at that point in time. But I remember I was like not living for him at that time. And I'll never forget, like my parents kept making me go to church. They still made me and my sisters get up at like five, six, seven in the morning. And we're sitting as a family and we're reading parts of scripture together. King James, mind you, like thou and thee. And I'm like in ninth grade, ninth, 10th grade. And I'm like, Oh, this is the worst, but it was consistency and it was being able to see my parents, no matter how much they've been hurt or how much, um, uh, the church has let them down that they knew that God was never the one that let them down. And they, they lived out that example for me. Um, and I'm just very appreciative of that. And, Um, It speaks to how much, because you don't realize what an impact your parents are making on you for the ones that are younger in the room. You don't realize, and and for the parents yourselves, but you don't realize the impact of your um, influence in your kids' lives and in in how how much your parents are influencing you. And so um, it's very important. So all of the parents that are in the room and all of the ones that will be parents one day, um, no matter what your experience was growing up, know that, um, it can be different with you. Like it can start with you and your legacy for your families. Um, and that's just really important. So, yeah.
So good. I'm going to try to make this as short as I can. Um, it's a cool story that has a couple twists and turns, but obviously I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for the decision of moving across the country and going to Bethel. So I think just having the three years out at Bethel with Bill and Chris and Danny and just leaders from all over um, speaking into your life consistently is amazing. But um, when I was out there, I started to dive into the Harvest Chapel School of Kingdom Living um, and was introduced to Dan Moeller and, and Todd White. But I, I, but I had already known Pastor Don because I had gone to Harvest Chapel when I was a teenager, kind of before Pastor Don stepped into this kingdom uh, revelation. So it was very much more of a salvation message. We need to get people saved and we need to get out of here. This world's getting worse. And then he read this book by Miles Monroe, Rediscovering the Kingdom Within You, and um, totally revolutionized who he is and how he preaches. Um, so long story short, Todd came out to Bethel when I was a student and uh, they brought him in for like 15 minutes of encouragement before we would go out to evangelize. And, um, it was Todd before he had like the big dreads. It was like mop hair Todd. And, um, he had like this all white garb on and I'm like, who is this guy? And he just started preaching the gospel in a way that I had never heard before. And I was like, who is this guy? And then he started to reference my hometown. And I'm like, how the heck, like, does this guy know like this small town in Pennsylvania? So I, I realized that, oh my gosh, like he's actually talking about the Harvest Chapel that I grew up in like as a kid. So I started to like dive into YouTube videos and watch Todd. So, I mean, Todd White definitely had a huge play in my life, but, and Dan Moeller, but um, the first time I was actually able to go to a leadership advanced conference out at Bethel was because I was a youth pastor in Red Bluff. So I got invited to go. So my then pastors got to sit and have dinner with Pastor Don and, and Todd, because Pastor Don had brought Todd out to Bethel to kind of introduce him to a few folks. And, and um, just for reference, Don is the um, one who planted Harvest Chapel, Chapel founding yep. pastor. Yep. Yeah. He's like essentially like the father of the house yep. right yep. now, even though Matt 100%. is senior, yep. is the uh, leader. Yeah. And um, so I'm opening up to Todd because at that time in my life, my parents got divorced when I was going into second year of school ministry. Never thought that was going to happen. Crazy. Uh, my mom actually ended up coming out doing first year when I did third year. Definitely didn't think that was going to happen. But my dad, when the divorce happened, he went down and fell into some bad patterns of his past and was in and out of jail. He, he started doing drugs and just really crazy lifestyle choices. So I knew Todd and his testimony. So I remember being at that dinner table and I'm like, Todd, I said, I really need you to pray for my dad. And I explained a little bit of what was going on. And um, I said, Todd, because, you know, my dad really needs Jesus. And Todd kind of pulled the fast one on me and said, Matt, we all really need Jesus. Never associate, or never put yourself in a situation where you think someone needs Jesus more than you do. So I was like, Ugh. Let's pray. <laughs> so we prayed. You're like, yes, please pray for yeah. me. <laughs> we, we pray, but I say that to, to big, give the bigger picture of how cool God is. And it's like we're in this big chess game because we get back to Bethel and we start doing worship. And I'm like, I'm a pacer usually during worship. So I'm pacing. And the Lord like starts leading me around the perimeter of the room. And I realize I'm getting closer and closer to like where the guests are. And I'm like, God, I already had my moment with Todd. I don't need Todd to pray for me again. I don't want to be that guy. Like, please, why am I getting closer and closer? And as I was getting closer and closer to them, um, the Lord was like, you're not going for Todd, you're going for Pastor Don. And they know that in that season of my life, I was very broken because I didn't have a father figure in my life. My dad's in and out of prison and I'm experiencing all these amazing things in the kingdom, but I, I still lacked that father figure. And I knew Pastor Don a little bit, but I didn't know him enough to justify what's about to happen. And I go and I just, I hug him and I just, I break down on his chest and I just start bawling. And I'm thinking like, this is crazy. Like, why am I doing this? This looks weird. But I really feel like in that moment, a son was being connected to a father. Yeah. Because I still youth pastored in Red Bluff for a, for a few other years before I got that call from Pastor Don. But I believe it was in that moment that God was knitting hearts together. So, the, so yes, Todd. Yes, Dan. 
But before all of that, obviously the Lord, but Pastor Don and Pastor Lori Wallaball are, are, are why we're here today doing what we're doing. Um, there are such gifts to the body of Christ. And it's cool for me to be able to be in the position I am in now, which is weird now being the lead pastor of the movement that spoke so loudly to my life when I was in school. But crazy, 10 years to the week that I took a picture with Pastor Don and Todd where Todd was praying for my dad. I'm at Lifestyle Christianity with Pastor Don. By this point, my dad has been completely restored. He folds the bulletins at my church every Friday. He has no drug addiction at all within him at all, completely detoxed from everything. And I'm sitting in Lifestyle Christianity. I'm looking at my, my Facebook memories, and I see that it was literally the anniversary of the week of. And I get a text from my dad while I'm sitting in Lifestyle, and he said, hey, bud, when you get home, um, I really want to go to the men's retreat weekend with you, but I have to be back by Sunday because I'm preaching in the mission this weekend. Come on, let's go. So look what God can do with, yeah. with, with, with a situation. It's insane to see how God can redeem all of those things and peace all those. At that moment, Todd didn't even know lifestyle Christianity would be a thing at that moment when I'm sitting there and he's praying. And who knew? I didn't realize that I was sitting at the table with the pastor that I was going to take his church over that he planted and started from the ground up. Yeah. But God. So how cool is that? Like if you have a situation right now where it seems completely hopeless, a prodigal son situation, um, a, a situation where, you know, there needs to be redemption between uh, a father and a son. I mean, my dad, I mean, the first week we started seriously talking and dating, Anna's like, what are you doing today? And I literally was on my way to visit my dad in rehab. That's the last thing I want to tell a girl that I'm starting to get to know, you know, who she knows I'm a pastor and I'm in ministry. Like, oh, hey, I'm sorry that your, your family is incredible, has all this rich, revival history, but I'm going to go visit my dad in rehab. But God, I mean, he, he, he didn't even come to our wedding because he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't imagine seeing my mom with someone else because my mom has been remarried now to now we have Easter dinner together and we're taking selfies together. My dad, my stepdad, me, we all, they all come to my church. That's pretty wild. Yeah. That's pretty wild. It's important to note though, that those in that that influence of Todd and Pastor Don in his life was the way that the Holy Spirit got a hold of him to love his dad into the kingdom. Because it wasn't just prayer and hoping that his name is Scott, that Scott would come into the kingdom. It was a it was a transformation in Matt's heart that actually made him go after his dad. There's a season while I'm in ministry at Pastor Don and Dan's church where my dad would call my phone. And because there's so much hurt, so much pain, I didn't even have my dad's number in my phone for a season. And I, but I knew it was him calling, but I wouldn't answer it because I was hurt. But I had to confront that. But Pastor Don loved me in that season. And, and actually, I started to receive the love of God in that season as my father. Like, God, before all of this, God, you're my father. So I started to receive that love into my life like never before. Then I was able to actually love myself in a pure way. Yeah. And then you can love your neighbor as yourself. Because a lot of us are trying to love our neighbor when we don't like ourselves. Hello. Hello. Huge. <laughs> huge. <laughs> huge. Receive God's love. Love yourself. Love others. So now God's doing a work in me. Pastor Don's encouraging me. Hey, buddy, when's the last time you talked to your dad? Good accountability. I need that question every once in a while. Why? Because I'm offended and hurt, probably not going out of my way to talk to my dad. But then you just see what God's doing. And we surprised him. He was living in a town about an hour away, isolated in a trailer by himself, just doing God knows what. And the Lord's like, you need him close to the church. Mm -hmm. So we had an apartment that the, church, that the church was paying for, for another minister that was kind of down and out in a season. So we, we got this uh, apartment, we furnished it. Um, this, this minister was actually going through chemo treatments. Um, he didn't know what to do. He was kind of similar to Anna's dad growing up in ministry, didn't have a lot of savings. So we did that. He actually gets a clean bill of health. So now God's perfect timing. We have this furnished apartment right by the church. So what do we do? We go in, we get pictures of, of us together with my dad, um, his grandsons for my brother. We frame them and we set my dad up and we're like, we got something to show you. I need to I need to have you help me pick something up. He's like, all right, no worries. And we get there, and um, the pastoral staff is in the, 
in the apartment when he walks in. He's like, hey, everybody. He's like, what are you guys doing here? Like, welcome home. And he goes, what? Like, yeah, this is your home. He starts to look around. He sees all the framed pictures. Dude, he loses it. He loses it. I lose it. But you see like beautiful redemption taking place in front of your eyes to where my dad's still struggling with a lot of physical ailments, congestive heart failure. We're believing we're contending for that to break. But man, look what God can do. Look what he can do. It's so beautiful. With Along with that, um, what was your process like in that grief um, and lament of experiencing just like that hopeless maybe feeling, but knowing like, no, I have my hope in the Lord. What was that process when you're talking about like experiencing the father's love? What did that look like for you? Like practically on a day-to-day basis? What did that, what did you do to connect to the father? Um, Yeah. Well, I think I actually really had to confront what needed healed because there was some areas of my heart that definitely needed to be healed by the Lord um, so being vulnerable and just saying, like, I'm upset, I'm frustrated, you know, I'm, I'm a little frustrated that my dad couldn't be at my wedding, like a little, little upset about that. But then allow the Lord to truly meet me in that place and say, you know, Matt, I love you. You know, Jesus wept. He's like, if you need to cry, cry it out. Like being real with, with emotions, not like having emotions and feelings, but not letting your emotions and feelings have you. There's a big Can difference. Can you say that one more time? Yeah, it's okay to have emotions and feelings, but we cannot allow our emotions and our feelings to have us. Because we will always be going through something to justify why we're not being who we're called to be in Christ. So I need the people in my life to continually remind me who I am in Christ. Like, Matt, I know this situation feels hopeless, but there's no such thing as a hopeless situation. So let's believe. Let's believe that God has a plan. Let's not put your joy and your hope and your faith in your dad making the right choice. Because God knows he could have went his whole life not making the right choice. And if my hope, my joy, my love is found in anyone other than Jesus Christ, I'm lost. My joy, my hope, my love is found in a person when it should be found in God. So I needed, I needed the Lord to, to lavish his love upon me. I needed to actually say, like, look, God, I don't need to work for your approval. You know, it's Jesus being baptized, the heavens open, and a loud voice says, this is my son who I love and whom I'm well pleased in. Essentially saying, Jesus, before you do anything in the context of ministry, I love you and I'm proud of you. You get to start your ministry off from a place of knowing you're loved and you're accepted. So the Lord started to really take me through that process of taking things that I know up here and started to experience them in here. And, and, and being patient, love is patient. If, you can't, if you're not patient, we shouldn't go to the rest. There's a reason why love is patient, patience is first. So if you're struggling with any of the other attributes of love, one, realize that love lives inside of you. You're not trying to obtain something that's within you. X marks the spot, you're it. You're where the treasure lies if you've surrendered your life to Jesus. We need to stop looking for him on the outside and realize that he found you. And he placed the the crown jewel of heaven within you and said, you never now need to spend another day of your life trying to obtain something that I've already given you. So once I started to experience God's love in that way, it became a lot easier loving my dad because now my love is not coming with a hook. I'm not saying, dad, I love you, but I'm waiting for him to say, I love you too, son, and I'm proud of you. I would have loved to hear that from my dad, but I hear that from my dad all the time now, and it means a lot to me, but I'm not defined by it. I'm defined by waking up every day and hearing that from my heavenly father. I have love tattooed on my wrist just in case I forget about it. That's who I am. That's my identity. My identity isn't I'm a I'm a pastor, I'm a husband, I'm a father. Who I am is I'm a loved son of God. Not because of what I do, but because of what he chose to do. And when you truly believe that, if you believe right, you'll live right. If you believe a bunch of lies, you're going to manifest a bunch of lies. If you believe you're the righteousness of Christ Jesus, I believe you're going to manifest righteousness. 
If you have a core belief in your heart that you're just a dirty sinner saved by grace and that's who you'll always ever be, you're actually going to sin by faith. Because you're attaching your belief system to your faith and saying, I'm a sinner. So now you're going to habitually struggle with sin. When we're no longer in a struggle with sin, sin has been defeated. Romans 6. But if you continue to read Romans 6, you can choose to put yourself back under that if you would like to, but you don't have to. I'm bunny trailing, but it's the gospel. Yeah. That's good. That was wonderful. Wasn't that good? That was good. Thank you guys so much for, for coming. And uh, Matt is going to be preaching Sunday, so don't miss that. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Anna's going to be leading worship again Sunday morning. Um, Love so. Anna share a little bit too. We don't, huh? we don't have a flight to catch, so we can yeah. have Anna share a little bit too. Yeah. Yep. It'll be really nice. Last time they were here, as soon as service was going, we're, we're out. Let's go. We're going to miss the flight. <laughs> and then you're like, there's construction. Yeah. And then there was construction. It was like, there we go, Matt. We're turning. <laughs> we barely made it. Um, but yeah, guys, thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Um, and tomorrow we have Caring for Kids at the Blue Water Convention Center. Conference Center, 10 a.m. to 12. So we'd love to see all y'all um, there at that. That we, we like every single year. I'm just like, man, we are making such a big difference, and it's really just because of Nate, Kate, and Bear spearheading this thing. So um, thank you. Can we just give them a hand yeah, too? Come on, because um, like they're doing, they're just, they're doing it just for fun <laughs> like they're doing it for the lord and they're, nobody's paying them it's just like they had an idea one day and they went out and did it i think about al and bev right now with their they're doing a food pantry out of their business like i am just amped on our church right now because i'm just like you like i i grew up in a church where it's like we got to ask the pastor to do things and it was like well it all has to be at the church it's good we got to get the pastor's approval and I just love, it's like, everybody's like, there's a need, do it. Yeah, come on. Yeah. There's a need, I will be the hands of feet. You know what I mean? And I'm like, trust me, no competition here. I'm like, go! <laughs> so I love to see it. Um, I love, we just like bless you guys for what you, what you both couples, what you guys are doing right now. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so be there for that tomorrow. We want to partner with that. And then I hope to see you all Sunday as well. Um, baby, you want to pray? Yeah, so Lord, we just thank you for this, for this beautiful night of uh, you pouring out your revelation through Matt and Anna. God, we ask that you would just um, bless Harvest Chapel, God, that you would pour out your spirit on their church, um, that you would move through their staff, that you would move through their, their people that attend, and that you would just move like a wildfire through their community and through the whole county, God. I ask that you would just... Uh, just guide us through this weekend um, and just develop this revelation deep within our hearts and uh, that we would go out and be the hands and feet um, in spreading the gospel. So we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Amen.